Hey everyone. I'm feeling much more like myself the last day or so, so that's great, obviously. Your exams are um, just about done. There's just a couple that I'll finish up uh, this evening. The, the rest of you should have received your um, exams with notes and a grade. And uh, a few of you have already emailed me back asking for um, clarification on a couple of notes. Totally fine. Um, so if you get your exam back with the notes that I provided and you just want clarification or a question, please reach out to me about that. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to get right into... Oh, I, oh, before I forget. So tomorrow... Well, because I'm recording this on Tuesday. Um, so... For me, it is tomorrow. You have an assignment due, but depending on when you're watching this. So you have an assignment due on the 14th. So I posted about this days ago. Well, one, it's been in your syllabus since the first day of class. Um, but also I posted, I think, at least two reminders. Um, well, one reminder and then actually the actual assignment. So if you go into modules, you'll see that you have um, an option for the documentary. So if you're looking on the course schedule in the syllabus, you'll see that you have to watch a documentary and then turn in notes really really easy points and um, there was an initial uh, documentary that I was going to show but I ended up, it, I changed my mind and so if you go into modules in our course shell and you go to do the documentary that's due 1014 you'll see that there are two options that you can choose from there's a link provided and and just follow the instructions really really easy assignment and a lot of points for the assignment so this is your opportunity to watch a really cool documentary learn something turn some notes and get a lot of points for the class so really easy excitement but also don't miss it let's do on the 14th okay so we're gonna get right into the PowerPoint uh, human osteology and bipedalism okay so slide two so the skeletal system um, it's important to think of the skeletal system as not just being the bones it also includes the cartilage um, and there's a lot of other stuff going on in terms of like what the actual skeletal system does. So it's going to support, um, you know, obviously provide structure for the muscles for, for your movement. It also provides protection for certain organ systems. And, and you might be wondering about this picture here um, on the right hand side. So this is like a personal, personal story. So that's actually um, a medicine, medicine called Zarxio. Um, and I had to do self injections when I was going through chemotherapy. So going through chemotherapy, your white cell, white, white blood cell count drops really low. But even for chemo patients, um, it can drop even lower than it should. And that's how mine was. It was it was very low, and um, I had to do the, these injections. Now the, the the first one they did for me at the oncologist office, but they said you know because I had to do them at every chemo treatment. For the three days following that treatment, I had to do an injection. So they said it doesn't make sense for you, exhausted from chemo, to drive all the way across town just to come in for an injection. So they set it up to where they showed me how to do the first one, and then the rest of them I would do. So every time I had a chemotherapy treatment, I had to for the three days following do a self injection into like just like a little fat in my tummy. Um, but uh, the, the what it what the medication does is it stimulates um, white blood cell. Um, Generation and so that that process occurs like in the occurs in the bone marrow like your legs and So imagine telling your body do this thing do it right now and do it really quickly So my legs it was just excruciating um, And so it, it's at it, the, the whole reason I want to tell you is that it's at These points in your life and you will either have experienced them or will experience them where you're going through medical issues and you realize like you are you know uh, Your person but you are, you know, to some extent, a combination of muscle and bone and vein and nerve and the little things you don't think about. You can read in a textbook and be like, okay, whatever, and then you experience them and it becomes a whole, you know, new dif a different experience um, and, and connection between all of that. So anyway, so it was at that point when I was doing the self-injection, which was already uncomfortable enough, but then experiencing the, the effect of what it was supposed to do, it was supposed to stimulate the white blood cell count to, you know, increase, you know, form so I didn't get sick. Um, but to, to realize my body was going through a process I could very specifically feel was just you know Like as an academic later on I can reflect back on it and be like whoa, but going through it was like you know, of course horrible But it's just interesting. Okay, so slide three So we have um, a two kind of main skeletal sections and you can see that in the picture um, in, in yellow and green so the yellow is what's called the axial 
a skeleton so that include basically like the muscle or the I'm sorry the bones like of, of your trunk area so you got the bones in the chest or your ribs sternum um, the the spine and then of course like the head and then the appendicular skeleton that's in green so the appendicular if you've ever heard of the term appendages that refers to your arms and your legs so the appendicular skeleton is in green so it's the bones of the arms and the legs and of course like the hands and the feet but it's also the bones that connect your arms and your legs to the main trunk of your body so like your pelvis and like your shoulder and clavicle those are part of the appendicular skeleton okay slide four an aspect to human osteology uh, is something called osteometry and if you understand like word origins um, and so it's basically the measurement of bone measuring bone in multiple ways so if you take um, the lab that's associated with this course you very likely I mean depending on obviously if we're still remote it's probably not gonna happen but if like next semester we're back to being on campus and depending on who your instructor is you should have at least a little or a lot um, experience doing this and it's a lot of fun um, when I teach the lab I you know definitely have the students use sliding calipers or like pictured here a spreading caliper and you do some general measurements of like you know the skull like the maximum width or breadth um, you can measure like a femur and because there's a lot that you can learn about an individual based on just even some basic measurements you can learn so we talked about this I think in the beginning of the semester when we talked about like the different subfields of anthropology um, so like just from measuring alone we can determine things like age sex ancestry stature using one health and of course like combined with some some visual methods as well slide five <clears throat> sex determination just as just as it sounds it's being able to determine whether someone is male or female based on the the bones in their body. Um, so just as a quick reminder, these two bullet points of homo sapiens are a sexually dimorphic species. There are clear, obvious differences between males and females in our species. And also be careful, like I said before, do not confuse sex and gender. So in this class, I've mentioned gender a few times only to reference the fact that it's not the same thing as sex. So sex refers to all these anatomical, biological, hormonal, morphological features that separate male from female into this binary, um, and that is a separate, completely separate from gender, and that would be something you would learn about like in the intro to cultural class, but it's not the same thing. So if I dig up some bones um, and I have a pelvis, I can tell whether, the, whether that individual is male or female, um, but I would never be able to understand their gender, um, gendered experience in their particular culture, what they thought in, in their minds, how they viewed themselves culturally. Like you'll never know any of that information just by looking at the bones, but you can tell, of course, you can tell sex. Slide six. Okay, so these are some general areas where we can determine whether an individual is male or female. So two main like general regions, the pelvis, so like the hip area and then the skull. And we're gonna talk about some of these in more specifically. Um, and then I just have this question, like why are these probably the best regions? So the pelvis, you, so think about that for a second. Why would the pelvis be one of the best regions? Why would, that, why would there be a clear difference between male and female in the, in the pelvic region? So hopefully what you're thinking is, well, probably childbirth, reproductive differences, it's all in that location. That's gonna have something to do with how the pelvic area for males and females is different, so that's true. So I'm gonna tell you right now that I have a question on the next exam for you uh, about this specific, this specific thing, like how to determine um, sex differences. Like what are, I think the question revolves around something like, like list, I don't know, like two or three or something, areas where they're different. And I think I ask in the question, like describe in detail, blah, blah, blah. But just as a heads up, what I'm not, I'm not looking for you is you to say skull and pelvis, like that's very general. What I'm looking for is the stuff we're gonna cover right now. So I have this list on slide seven, you'll see this list of traits um, that I'm gonna show you the difference between the male and the female state. And I, like I said, on the, on the exam, I feel like the question's clear, but every semester, well, I should say the last like, maybe, like three semesters that I've taught this class, there's always at least one or two students who misunderstand the question. So I wanna make sure I can give you guys like a heads up right now. But what I'm looking for is for you to describe one of these features. So slide seven, like I said, I'm like 95% sure that's gonna be a question on your exam. Okay, so here we have on slide seven, the osteological traits that we use to determine sex. There are many, many more, but for the purposes of this class, I'm just giving you a handful. So it looks like we have four from the pelvic area and then five for the skull area. 
Um, like I said, there, there are many more, but these are some really good uh, examples, some really great visuals I can show you with it being like, you know, just on a PowerPoint, not having you in the lab. In the lab, you probably will be able to learn many, many more. At least when I teach the lab, I definitely have my students learn more. And it's easier to learn because you can literally like, I mean, it's like fake, but you can take, pick up the pelvis and look at it and like compare them. You're like, oh, it's so obvious. I can really see in three dimensions, you know, what she's talking about versus on a two dimensional picture. It's a lot harder. Okay, so we're gonna go through these. So there's a slide for, for this list of nine. I have a slide for each of them. So we're gonna go through these. So the first one is the pelvic outlet or inlet, depending on which um, direction you're looking. So slide eight. So if you look at these two, one is a male and one is a female. Now take a second, think about it. Which one do you think is the female? Which one do you think is the male? <clears throat> so if you said that the one on the left is the female, you'd be correct. So there's a couple things I want you to notice. So it's kind of showing in like that staggered line that the, the female is a little more round and the male is a little more heart shaped. The general shape is, is different. And also, um, I know you're not, I'm assuming most of you are not familiar with a lot of the bones of the body. Uh, if you've taken the lab component that goes along with this lecture, then you, then you might view. I don't want to give you guys too much terminology, but if you just look um, at this area, because we're giving, like, we're looking at the pelvis, but we're kind of tilting it. We're looking as if, you know, we're looking straight through. The There's the bone called the sacrum, so that's at the very base, like, where your tailbone is. On the male, you can see that the sacrum kind of curves. It's much more of an anterior or forward curve to it, and that kind of gets in the way of that space. Imagine if there is a something trying to be birthed through there, that curved bone is gonna get in the way. So we see this feature with males as well, that that sacrum is often curved towards the, you know, towards the front anteriorly. So, but also, but the main thing is that you see that general shape that it's all, like whenever you're looking at the pelvis when it's bigger, wider, it's more expanded, that's gonna be a female feature because it has to do with um, birthing offspring versus males doesn't need to be there. Okay, so slide nine, that's something called pubis shape. So there's a bone. So the pelvic bone, we often refer to it like it's one bone, but it's actually one, there's the sacrum that's in the back, but the left and the right um, pelvic bone is actually three bones on each side. The, the pubis, the ischium, and the ilium. You don't need to, for the lab, you probably need to learn that, but for now, like don't stress too much about it. But just so you're aware, there's the bone, like I said, called the pubis. That's kind of the very like front part of your pelvic bone. And you can see in the picture, um, I'm comparing, uh, there's a male and a female, and there's also another like a, an x-ray. That's actually a picture of mine, and I wanted to show you so you can kind of see. If you're looking at that x-ray, look at the very bottom and see in the, in the, like the bottom middle how those two sections, clearly those two sides of the bones are coming together, and there's like kind of like a tiny little gap. There's actually cartilage there, but you can't quite see it on the x-ray. Um, so that's the, that, that area, that's the pubis that, um, um, where there's that gap, that kind of squared off shape of bone, uh, that's the, pu the pubis. Um, in a male or a female, it's often going to be shaped quite differently. And so this is, so go back to the other side, um, looking at the male or the female. What we tend to see is for, so the female is the one on the left. Females, that shape of that pubis tends to be more uh, square or rectangular. And for males, it tends to be more triangular. So hopefully you can kind of see that from that picture. Basically what's happening is whenever you have, and, and this is why I wanted to show you mine, is mine is a really good example. Mine is quite rectangular. Whenever you look at that, it's rectangular, it, it's giving it more space. If it were square versus rectangular, it's like elongated, basically allowing there to be a little extra space um, in this area. So that's a very feminine, uh, a very female feature. Uh, also, if you're wondering, I think I might have mentioned this to you guys before, but if you're wondering, uh, in that x-ray, I had this x-ray done because I had um, a sterilization procedure done in 2014. And um, that's my, they're called Esher implants. I had nickel coils inserted into my fallopian tubes um, so I can't have children It's and it's, it's non-reversible. Um, so, but they had to go in a few months later after the procedure to do the x-ray to make sure everything looked good and everything was in the right place. And so that's what that is. But I, whenever I go in for images, I always try to get a copy, like for teaching purposes to show you guys. In fact, I, I, I probably have some more in this. In the, when I teach the lab, I have quite a few because we, we, we spend a, like a huge section of the course going over human osteology. In this lecture, I might maybe have one or two. Okay, so slide 10. 
subcubic angle. So on uh, this picture, you have a male and a, or a female on the left again and a male on the right. And you can see on the bottom of each of those figures, it says subcubic angle. Now look, and there's already a line drawn. Look at the difference between the female angle and the male angle. So the female is the one on the left, male is the one on the right. Um, for females, it tends to be more obtuse, um, and for males, the angle tends to be more acute. So basically, we need it's more narrow, you know, it tends to be male, the more wide it gets. Like I said, whenever it's bigger, wider, expanded, female feature, it's going to be female. Now, I want to make, as I go through this, I want to make this clear. It's not as if every female has that exact pelvis, and every male has that exact pelvis. Of course, we've talked about this before, one of the great... Uh, features of nature is that there's always going to be variation but so these are kind of like classic examples um, and you as a fem female might have like you know if we're going through these nine features you as a female might have like eight of the ten, or eight of the nine and one of your features is a little more like not quite because there's going to be variation in between here we have you know in this picture for example slide 10 we have one that's very angled or very open obtuse and one that's very narrow there's going to be a little bit of variation in between those of course like for any of these features for any feature in in nature right um but like i said um you will you will see these in as gen generally being true especially when, you, when you're taking them as a group of traits so if you're looking at the pelvis you're like oh okay i'm looking at you know these these whatever 11 features 20 features of the pelvis and you're like okay this is clearly female because 20 of these or you know 19 of the 20 are clearly indicating female, and this one is kind of more what we call intermediate. You would be able to say, well, obviously a female. Um, so so don't, don't forget that variation exists, that there's sometimes there's intermediate of these features, so it's important to look at a combination of the features, but there being sometimes an intermediate of the features, of course, like I've said before, it doesn't take away from the fact that there are clearly still groups, male and female, and these traits can be clearly grouped into male and female. And also the other point I want to make is if you are a female and let's say you're, I'm looking at, you know, these features that we're going to talk about these nine and you only have, you know, say maybe for you as an, like, unless you got x-rays, you probably would never know. Um, but if you're, if you happen to know and you're like, okay, seven of my, of these features are, are more female and the other two are kind of more intermediate, that doesn't say anything about who you are as a person in the world doesn't say anything about your attractiveness. So there's a feature that's gonna come up, I think, in a second. Um, I, so I'll get a little ahead of myself now just because I'm kind of like talking about it now. But in a minute, after a few slides, we're gonna talk about like jaw shape, so the mandible shape. Now for males, what we tend to see is very square jaw is more masculine feature and a more rounded um, or pointy jaw or angle jaw. And the females is, you know, um, uh, more likely to occur but it doesn't mean that females don't sometimes have a square jaw and it definitely doesn't mean that when females have a square jaw it's not attractive does that make sense so you might have a you know more masculinized feature in, in randomly in your body it doesn't take anything away from who you are as a female it doesn't take anything away from how, how you are deemed to be attractive in your culture at all and I always think about the example of um, Emily Deschanel from the show Bones. She's this very, you know, angular jaw. Um, if you, like, definitely more of a masculine trait in terms of, like, identification and osteology. But no one would ever, I mean, maybe, but I, like, I can't imagine anyone ever saying she was unattractive or that even, like, her jawline or her face was unattractive. She's very beautiful. So don't confuse those two things that if you're a female and you have a, a masculine osteological trait, that it means something about who you are in any other sense like that's not the same thing okay make sure that's clear okay but back to the subcubic angle okay so we looked at more obtuse versus um more acute okay so slide 11. sacral angle also oh, i mentioned this already with the sacrum so that's that bone in the back like where your tailbone is your tailbone is your coccyx so this is showing it from the side and you can see um female on the left male on the right and the male one is slightly just more slightly curved males tend to have more of a curved one females not so much it's a little curved it's curved in everyone but males tend to have that like kind of extra curve because it doesn't need it doesn't matter for females if there's a curve that's going to be she's probably going to die during childbirth or have major complications especially considering like evolutionarily like historically so 
Okay, slide 12. So now getting onto the features of the skull. Super ciliary arches. So you see I even have this little, you know, line pointing to it. So this feature right here, like right about the bone, the bony prominence where you're like right around, right around where your eyebrows would be. Most females, like myself as an example, we tend to have our forehead is fairly flat the whole way. For males, what we, op what we sometimes see is like kind of a prominence projecting out kind of right in this area now not every male will have that and even when males have it it tends to, it can be you know slight to moderate to extreme you know there's going to be variation you might even see the occasional female who has a little and you might see the male occasionally who doesn't have who has a really flat forehead because there's always going to be variation but as a general rule this is true females tend to have very flat foreheads especially in that region of the eyebrow and males tend to have a little bit of a prominence Slide 13, forehead angle. So you can see here with the forehead angle, um, females tend to have a very vertical forehead. Males tend to have more of a slight, just ever so slight angle back posteriorly forehead. Um, and you can see that in the picture. Slide 14, mastoid process. So this is a feature, it's a kind of like a bony prominence on your skull where muscles attach, it's right behind your ear. You can't I mean, you, maybe you could kind of feel it, like not really on yourself. But no surprise, females, it tends to be smaller. You can see there in the picture, males tends to be more like larger because the muscles that are attaching like here, like in the neck and stuff are gonna be larger in the male. So it makes sense that that attachment, that bone attachment for the muscle would also be bigger. Okay. Slide 15, so like I said before, talking about the jaw or the mandible, you can see there's kind of two views. One is that front view. So males, we tend to see more you know, wide or squared off front of the jaw. For females, it tends to be a little more rounded or pointy. And then of course from the side, where we have more of a right angle to the ascending ramus, uh, more of a male feature. Um, and for females, it tends to be a little more angled. We tend to see that. Slide. 16 the nuchal region so that's in the back of your head on the occipital bone basically you have a lot of muscles that come up and attach from your neck as a female you're going the, that muscle structure is going to be less than if you are a male so it makes sense then like i said the muscle att is attaching to the bone if there's more muscle or less muscle that bony area the bony prominences of muscle attachment will be more or less depending on the amount of muscle and obviously mapping on to whether you are male or female Okay, so slide 17. Okay, so we, now we're kind of moving on to the next part, hominins. Mm. Have I used this term with you guys before? I feel like I must have. I know I've used it with the other class. I hate this because I'm always like, did I say it to you guys or did I say it to the other class? And I recently taught some stuff about hominins at the med school too. So, okay, I don't think I've talked to you guys in detail about this, so we'll just go through this. Okay, so here you can see, obviously, I'm, I'm showing myself as the, the example of, you know, homo, the homo uh, genus. Um, so hominins, this is a term we use to describe anything in the human lineage since our split with chimpanzees. So actually, I always have these out and I like, almost never use them. I can finally use them. Okay, use my dry erase. Very excited. Okay. So, like I said, I think I think I even probably drew this picture for you guys before. So we have, you know, chimp, human. So here we have chimp, human, and then our last common ancestor. This was about six million years ago. I miss having a board in class. Okay. So everything in this lineage right here. That's a hominin. Now, it's not going to be a nice straight line. There's going to be like branching events. It's going to get really messy. Stuff's going to die out. But essentially, everything in that line, whether it's directly related to, like in our direct line or not, if it's between the last common ancestor with chimpanzees and, and currently, it's called a hominin. Now, you might see it in like an older textbook or an older professor might even use this term. They might say hominid. Um, we don't say that anymore. Basically, we recognize that. Um, I mean, this is one of the things I talked to you guys about before about change, science changing with new evidence and, and cladistics and or uh, taxonomy and phylogeny. 
that as we come up, as we find new evidence, like say DNA, for example, and we, it can inform on what we know, sometimes you have to make adjustments to the, the current knowledge. So basically we had the term hominid, um, like this is a simplified version of it, but basically if you look at those three photos of chimps, humans, and gorillas, and let's say you knew outright those three species are related to each other, and someone asked you, okay, they're all related to each other, but which two are probably a little more closely related to each other? And the third, which one's kind of the third one, the odd one out? Visually, you might just think, well, okay, they're all clearly similar, but the chimp and the gorilla are probably more closely related, and it's the human who's kind of the odd one out. In fact, we know because of DNA that that's not accurate. Chimps and humans are more closely related to each other than either one of them is to gorillas. Gorillas are actually the odd one out. So after we learned this, you had, we, there was kind of an adjustment to the naming. So hominid actually still means something now, but it means something different. And so oh, don't get overwhelmed with this. The whole point of this is, is just understanding that we call those in our lineage hominins. Okay. Um, okay, I don't wanna get too far ahead of myself with you guys on that. Okay, so slide 18. So if we're thinking of all of those species in that lineage since our split with chimps you know about six million years ago to now and you already might even kind of be aware of some of these like we talked about neanderthals or homo erectus or homo habilis or lucy who was an australopithecine or maybe you've heard of like artipithecus so in six million years you can imagine the amount of change the the extreme differences in all those different species the genera and species that, that are going to happen and how we're going to look you know similar in some ways be very different in other ways there's a lot of stuff happening in those six million years so this is true but as a group even though there are quite a few differences as a group we can still make some general um uh we can still why am i blanking on the word i was going to say we can still have some general guidelines for what what characteristics kind of characterize a character characterizes as a group okay I, that was a word i was seeing in my can't think of it okay but so these are these are the six traits that can characterize this as a group and we call this a suite of traits a group of traits or a suite of traits um but also i have at the, the very bottom it's important to remember, remember this concept called mosaic evolution basically what it means is when we're talking about these features like all these features that hominins share or before when we were talking about the, all the features that primates share or if you're talking about all features that that you know mammals share or whatever it is you have to remember that all of those traits didn't happen at exactly the same time and they didn't occur at the same rate so this is going to be important factors we talk about these uh, actually throughout the rest of the semester we talk about the hominins and, and all these different species specifically okay so the six features i have them listed here but i think i have a, at least one slide per maybe even two let's see okay so the first one slide 19 larger brain size so it's important to, oh, so, so okay, I'm getting too far ahead of myself. Okay, so look at the photos. You'll see there's a chimp on top and a human on the bottom. Uh, now, we did not evolve from chimpanzees, uh, but we obviously are closely related to them. We share a common ancestor with them. Um, so, you know, six million years ago, there was that, whatever the ancestor was. And, um, you know, there are two populations split and one went on its own evolutionary trajectory that eventually became chimpanzees, another went on another evolutionary trajectory that eventually became homo sapiens. So we are related in that sense. So uh, in terms of brain size, though, if you look at the modern chimp, their brain size is about 400 cc's or cubic centimeters. And for humans, it's significantly different, you know, around 13 to 1400, um, depending. So there's an average there, about 1350 for the human, the homo sapien. Um, we also tend to have more of a rounded, um, a rounded skull, or what we call globular skull. We also have more of a forehead. So if you kind of look at the chimp, like every their head, their brain's kind of behind their eyes versus humans and many other hominins we'll talk about. We start to see more of a brain up on top. So this is interesting. Um, but this is what I was gonna say a second ago. I was gonna get ahead of myself. This thing about EQ, or what we call encephalization quotient. Um, and I might end up talking a little bit more about that later, so I don't wanna get too far into it now. But basically what this idea is, it's so the difference between absolute brain size and, and this idea of, you know, like a, a encephalization quotient or like relative brain size. So when you're looking at just the actual brain size of like, 
you know, chimpanzees to humans, for example, you could say, okay, chimpanzees 400 cc's, humans 1400 cc's, like that's the difference. But that doesn't really tell you a lot if you didn't already know like what the body size of those animals are. Like that's really important. Looking at the brain size of an animal compared to its body size, because you could have an animal that has a bigger brain than a human, but it doesn't imply anything about like cognition or memory. It doesn't imply anything about, we wouldn't know anything. Um, because the animal could just be bigger, right? And so it's really important to look at this thing called, like I said, EQ. It's this ratio between the body size and the brain size of any animal. And basically what we see, like if you were to like take all animals and map them out in terms of like comparing brain size to body size, you would see that there are quite a few species who given their body size, their brain is much larger than you would expect for an animal of that size. And a human is an example of this. Our brain is much larger than you would expect for you know an, an um, a mammal or a primate of our of our of our body mass, um, and what we see is usually this maps onto like higher cognitive ability and um, self awareness and and some other things. So of course humans are not the only primate or mammal that has this. Other apes absolutely have a higher uh, EQ. Chimpanzees, you know, um, other non primates too. Uh, dolphins. Elephants, um, some birds. I like I said. I don't want. To, I'm going to spend some time on this later, so I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But just keep it in mind that when we say larger brain, we are talking about the actual absolute brain size getting bigger at, through the hominin lineage. But um, there's also this important aspect of EQ. Okay. So moving on to slide twenty. Another feature of hominins, we are bipedal. I would argue probably the most important uh, uh, feature that characterizes us as a group. Um, in fact, when you find the bones of a, well, you, you're like, is this a hominin? The first thing you look for is if you can tell whether it's bipedal and you can tell whether an animal is bipedal in multiple parts of the body, pretty much every part of the body. It doesn't have to just be the leg bones. You can be the foot bone, the skull, like, the spine, like any, almost every part of the body, you can tell whether that animal is bipedal. Walking on two limbs versus walking on four, which was the ancestral condition. Slide 21, we have reduced prognathism. So hominins have, of course we are included in that, hominins reduced prognathism. Basically, so if you recall, prognathism is projection of the snout, uh, projection of the face. So. Um, those in our lineage from six million years ago to now we have it it's flatter and flatter and flatter and we see this general trend faces kind of in those six million years just get flatter and flatter and flatter until basically for a human we basically have no prognathism at all and this is just showing you a picture comparing like a modern chimp to a human how they have more of that ancestral state where it's like moderately prognathic slide 22 So you can see, uh, oh, there are two on this one, the last two, so number five and number six. We don't have a what's called a CP3 hone or honing complex. So that picture right there, it's showing that very large upper canine, the quite large lower canine, the premolar, the large space between the lower canine and premolar, it's called a diastema. There's this whole feature complex going on, basically this large canine that we see in many primates that they have for sexual selective purposes. Um, the two bottom teeth have to have a space in a, a, to allow for that giant canine, and it also allows it to be sharpened. So like hominins from six million years ago in our lineage till now, none of us have the, any part of this feature. And then we also have the, this is the next one, is we tend to have thick enamel. This is very unique. Most other uh, apes tend to have thin enamel on their teeth. So maybe implications for diet change there. Okay, so. Those are, oh wait, no, I'm sorry, there was one more. Wait, one, brain size, two, bipedalism, three, prognathism, oh, sorry. No, CP3 hone was four, thick enamel was five, and then number six, parabolic dental arch. So slide 23. Parabolic dental arch. Um, so this is a, uh, in contrast to what we call parallel tooth rows. So basically, if you look at the, let me just draw it. So for, if you were to compare like a chimpanzee so they're, if you were looking at their palate, it would look more like that, where the molars and premolars would be like, those lines would be parallel to each other versus like showing there in that picture, 
we tend to have more what's called parabolic. This is a shitty picture, but you can kind of see the difference where it's um, parabolic. It's more of an arch to it. Um, so we have the same number of teeth, and but our faces are getting flatter. T teeth are getting smaller too. Um, but we have to put that same number of teeth into a flatter face. So how do you think it's going to adjust? It's going to adjust this way. So this is a definitely a feature we see um, that characterizes hominins. Types of bi- oh, let's get that one. Let's get that, don't worry about that one. Okay, slide 25. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to just some more details about bipedalism. So that's walking on two limbs rather than four, walking on your hind limbs or your legs. We are not the only bipedal animal. We are definitely not the only bipedal primate that has ever existed, but currently we are the only bipedal primate that exists. So like I already said before, we can, um, there are the changes basically throughout the entire body when you see an evolutionary transition from quadrupedalism to bipedalism. Um, I have some, I think that's what these pictures are coming up. Okay, so let's go to slide 26. Okay, yeah. so the shape of the spine is different. So here it's showing a quadruped just in an upright position to kind of show you the visual comparison. So here we have like a generalized, you know, ape, probably like a chimp-like. Oops, ah, that was my PowerPoint go. Oh my gosh, okay. Um, so like you can see the spine that for chimps, they kind of have one kind of curve because they're quadrupedal. And for the human, the biped, two curves, a lumbar curve and, and the cervical curve. That was right. Um, and, oh, it's like a little story there. I was like, is that right? It's like literally, there's a bullet point, cervical lumbar, okay. Um, this is, you know, when you have the entire, um, you know, a major part of the weight of your body on your spine in a very different position, it's going to adjust like how that spine, you know, is, exists, you know, during your lifetime. And in fact, the, um, that curve kind of develops like as you develop. So the cervical curve or the curve like on like at the base of your neck actually starts kind of to, oh my gosh, starts developing when you as a human infant can learn to hold up your own head. And then the lumbar curve, the one at the, your lower back begins to develop when you begin walking as a child. Slide 27. So there are also multiple changes to the pelvis and the leg. So I have, and hopefully you can see it in this picture. So um, the pelvic will be called the pelvic girdle or like basically the whole pelvic structure, all those multiple bones, including like the sacrum and stuff. Um, you can see here in this picture, the one on the left is the biped and the one on the right is the quadruped. Imagine like a human and a chimp being compared. The pelvis, notice the difference in the pelvis. Humans and bipeds have what's called a bowl shaped pelvis because imagine like here's our pelvis, half more than half our body weight and all our organs and everything is sitting on top of that pelvis. So the shape of it's going to be very different versus, you know, like this in a quadruped, you can see in the picture, where because it's kind of laying on like their back, if they're, if they're you know, or like their lower back, if they're quadrupedal, there's not that same amount of body weight sitting on top of those bones. Um, that's the first one, okay, so gluteal, okay. So also the second bullet point, just the muscles are, are everything, the bones, the muscles, like everything is in a different position if you were a quadruped versus if you were a biped. So imagine like, if you, and you can probably Google this, um, chimpanzee, like a chimpanzee walking bipedally or an ape walking bipedally, they don't just suddenly start walking like a human. They kind of do a waddle. It's because like their muscles and are, are structured and attached in a very different way to be efficient as a quadruped, not a biped. Just as if you started trying to walk quadrupedally, you couldn't start running across the yard like your dog, right? You would have a very difficult time. One, your limbs are, are different proportions. Um, but also your muscle structure is very different, so it would be very difficult for you. Um, the third bullet point down, valgus knee. So you can see here, this is what I've indicated in the red, that actually our femur, so that bone in the upper part of the leg, the femur is actually angled. This allows for a better center of gravity and more efficient bipedal walking um, versus in the quadruped, they don't need that. You know, everything changes when suddenly all of your body weight is on two limbs versus four. 
And then the fourth bullet point you see there that um, because we are bipedal, because of our, all of our body weight is on those two limbs, the whole structure of our foot has shifted, so we don't have that divergent big toe. And if you look at the picture of the, you know, the chimp, their big toe is, is like our, our thumb on our hand, it sticks out. They can use their feet like we use our hands. So we're kind of like, we think that looks weird, but in reality, looking at our feet like our feet are weird, we are the odd one out. All the other apes have that divergent big toe. So we're the weird one. Um, but it's because it allows for, um, actually moving on to slide 28, you'll see what it allows for this, this foot. So bipedalism in the feet. So you can see here the difference between the chimpanzee foot and the human foot from the bottom um, and then from the side. So this is what I wanted to say. So from the side, so we have arches to our feet. We have that, what's called the longitudinal arch. So that arch that runs from like your toe to your heel. And you can see the picture of those bones that human, the homo, you know, example has that and chimpanzee is completely flat. Um, and also you can see in the other picture, you have an arch that kind of runs from left to right or like medial laterally, um, a little tiny arch. So we both have that, but the other apes, the quadrupeds don't have that longitudinal arch, we, but we both have a transverse arch. But imagine like now you have to have this whole system of like shock absorption and stuff like on those two uh, limbs that are supporting the entire weight of your body. Okay, so slide 29. Childbirth. So this one I wanted to, like, we could spend a whole day talking about childbirth and bipedalism and brain size and there's something called the obstetrics dilemma. Um, basically, and this is the point I want to get at, very simplified for you, is this idea of there being comp competing strategies evolutionarily. That there might be a benefit to being a big-brained primate. There also might be a benefit to being a um, bipedal primate. But if those two things are in, con if they are in conflict with each other, so becoming bipedal completely shifted the shape of our pelvis. So you can see here it's showing this the shape of the pelvis from a human or a chimpanzee to a human. And also we have bigger brains. Our infants are born with bigger brains. So you can see that it makes it much more difficult that the shape of the pelvis, in fact, like the, the picture kind of shows you like the shape of the pelvic inlet or outlet for the chimp is, you know, kind of elongated and their baby's head is a bit smaller. So easy childbirth for human and other bipeds, the shape of the pelvis kind of makes it a little more difficult shape and our like the our offspring's heads are bigger. So it's just like it's this awkward fit. Um, so it's interesting to think about like something like being bipedal could literally kill you in childbirth. And when we think about biology or like evolution and, and that and that process, that reproduction is like key to all of it, right? Um, that if there's something that's causing you to have an issue with maybe you can't birth your offspring and pass down your genes and it's still happening, it must mean there's a great benefit to it. But the, like like I said, trust me, like we could spend, probably spend days talking about this. There's a lot of research into this, looking at it from an evolutionary perspective and why and how and blah, blah, blah. Like, but just know it's a thing. Kind of think about that in terms of like competing strategies because this might come up later that evolution and the evolutionary process, there are so many things going on. Like, there, like I said here, you, there might be um, a natural selective process going on for the brains to get bigger and the pelvis to be a different shape and the feet to be one shape and da da da. And it's not, sometimes those things are not harmonious, you know, especially when they're completely different parts of the body. So it can be com beautiful and complex, the evolutionary process. Slide 30, so here's the question. So why did bipedalism emerge? There are so many hypotheses to explain it. We will just go over a couple right here. So slide 31, basically it's more, uh, it's more energy efficient. Um, you burn less, fewer calories. Um, there's also the idea of like you getting less sun exposure because like the part of your body, like it's just energetically, it's just, it's better. And I think I might've mentioned this to your guys, to your class before, I'm not sure about and like another thing about a trade-off that humans, you know, because we are bipedal, we are very slow, but because we are bipedal, we can go for very long distances. So think about how you like, even like, like, even with like with this one right here, like if I tried to run with her, we had a race, she would beat me like for like, okay, run from like 500 feet or something. Like she beat me every time. Like 
even a tiny little dog is crazy fast, right? I've never been, in fact, she's gotten outside before, this was years ago, she got outside, she got through my feet, and I chased her down the road, she ran in front of a car, about had a heart attack, because there's no catching her, you know, as a quadruped, they're so much faster, but they cannot go for long periods of time. So like if you like go jogging, maybe you jog with your dog, you probably notice whether it's a big dog or small dog, very quickly they will get tired. This has to do with like just the, the energy that it is, that they use when walking and or running and also the position of their organs and their lungs and their bone and like just the whole the whole way it's built up now humans we can go you could walk 20 miles and be like Meh. like i mean maybe your legs are hurt a little the next day but that's not like outrageous to consider and and like when it's not crazy hot i usually go for a morning walk and i'll do like a mile and sometimes i'll take them but i know i can't go very far because even a mile you'll think it's not very long um, even for them, it's, you know, it's uh, it's a lot. And also, like, there are humans who do, like, those, like, ultra marathons or doing, like, you know, they're jogging 100 miles. Now, not maybe not every human could do that, but it's, it, every human could probably, if they trained, could do that. But we definitely can, on average, definitely, you know, you could walk or even jog five miles. Like, it wouldn't be that difficult, you know. Um, but for quadrupeds, they just cannot do that. And so there's some trade-offs. We're not very fast, so we can go long distances, which if you are in a, there's an environment where being able to like travel for food or water resources or trade, it might be better to be able to walk farther than necessarily to go fast for very short periods of time. Like it's a trade-off. So this is one of the ideas about bipedalism. And also being when people like freed up our hands for stuff. Huge one. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, slide 32, ecology. So this is looking at that there were probably uh, and actually kind of slide 32 and 33 kind of go together looking at um, the ecology of the land versus like and food resources so these two things kind of go together that um, in in a time when you know um, the environment's changing the the we're going from from more forest to fewer more open savannas the food type is changing and suddenly you might you might be walking much farther from food patch to food patch Versus like they're just being tree, tree, tree with food. You might have to actually walk farther distances. Maybe there are more predators. Being able to be taller, walk more efficiently, um, carry food with your hands that are now available. Like all of these things in conjunction with each other. And then slide 34 is looking at a hypothesis from a sexual selection perspective. Um, so we talked about this before with humans having um, hidden ovulation or, or human, human females having hidden ovulation that um, being bipedal like the it's not a there's not a visual indicator it's it was it's hidden um, and and not just that it's hidden like it's hidden but not like how am I trying to say this they uh, it's not like it's happening you just can't see it because we're bipedal, like bipedal it's literally like the whole the whole process has shifted and so we don't have this, imagine you as a female had this like swelling, you wouldn't be able to walk, right? So that's not gonna happen. Um, but also we talked about this before, but what this means if, if a male of the species can't tell if a female is ovulating or when she's ovulating, it really drastically shifts the, um, the strategies of both the male and the female. So this could be something like that has to do with why we are bipedal, that it was an evolutionary advantage for females for in some way. In reality, it, it, it's probably a combination of more than one factor. I think most paleoanthropologists would probably consider that to be true. Probably never, it probably is not one thing, probably a combination of things. And I literally, on slide 35, I say that it's probably a um, combination of these factors. But like I said, kind of just think about that, like how, how much more beneficial it is to have your hands free, to carry food, to carry a baby, to carry a baby and food, to walk far distances carrying your baby and food, um, and, and also now because you're a possible partner or your, or your actual partner can't tell when you're ovulating that now they are providing more, uh, resources to you in this new environment. So, you know, it's a combination of all these things. Okay. So that's it for this one. And I will see you guys on the next one.